Good afternoon. This is Dave Small, president of the Althor Bird Nature Club for this session of the Dave and Dale Nature Journal. And with me today is our, my co-host, Dale Manette. Welcome everybody. And uh, here we are for a second round. Um, today, we're gonna talk about the bald eagle restoration that took place at the Quabbin Reservoir in the mid 80s. Um, we've all seen bald eagles around here every year. There's more and more of them, but um, today we have the story on how they got here. Yeah, and this is a great, uh, great story that that uh, we'll be going through. And and uh, Dale and I happen to have been around uh, when a lot of this began and and got to follow it all the way through. So um, we want to go like to the to the next slide here. If we look at the that the founder of this program really was was Jack Swedberg, and. Um, Jack was a wildlife photographer for Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, he did a lot of filming out at Quabbin. Uh, he got a lot of great stuff of goshawks and other things out there. And uh, he was uh, kind of a, a force to be reckoned with when it came to trying to get this bald eagle program going. And he had a handshake that would bring <laughs> you to your knees. Uh, every time I met Jack, he would come over and shake my hand and he'd, he'd bend me right over. And I got involved in this project when I was a student at UMass. And um, I had a professor that asked me if I would be interested in helping a graduate student named Dave Nelson uh, work on a project that he thought that I would enjoy because I, he knew that I had spent so much time at the Quabbin and they were gonna restore the bald eagles to the state of Massachusetts. Um, they hadn't been in nesting in Massachusetts since 1906. And because the Quabbin was so large, uh, it was perfect to have nesting eagles. So they were going to um, use a process called hacking. And there were, there were towers. They were going to build a tower on the Quabbin. And they were going to bring two bald eagles down from the state of Michigan when they were six weeks old. And they would keep them in the Quabbin Reservoir, in the, in the tower that you see here. Um, and they would raise them until they were 12 to 14 weeks old. Uh, because bald eagles will imprint on an area that they grow up in, j just like a salmon. Um, the plan was to move along for another five or six years and, and they were going to run more birds down from parts of Canada. Uh, so they, they made some additions to the top of the tower. Next um, slide. You can see in this picture here how they prepared to have six to eight eagles that they left, they left every year. And what they would do is they would fly around these tremendous areas that had plenty of bald eagles, and they would find a nest that had two young birds in them. They would take one bird and they would send it down. They'd, they'd climb a tree, they'd drop it down, take one of them, drop it down in a, in a bag, and they would examine it to make sure there was no problems with it, and then they would ship it to Massachusetts and the other eagle would stay with his parents and this would guarantee that both eagles were going to survive because one was not going to have to deal with sibling rivalry and the other one was going to come to Quabbin and it was going to live in the tower and be taken care of. Yeah we're looking here at the uh, veterinarians inspecting the eagles they were coming to Massachusetts to make sure they were healthy and we weren't introducing any um, diseases or other things that uh, would be coming in. So they're making sure the young birds are pretty healthy. In the next slide, you'll see um, Diane um, um, Davis, who um, is bringing the uh, new chicks into the, into the uh, hacking tower. Uh, the towers were structured so that the the birds could be fed without seeing the people doing the feeding. Um, so they did imprint on people. And um, there was a petition between where the birds were and where the people were so that they could be um, fed regularly without um, really getting that imprint on the person itself, you know, which was pretty important when we're trying to uh, you know, 
get these things um, growing up without being too too attracted to people itself. They they, they didn't want the uh, eagles bugging the fishermen. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, so. I mean, this process went on what, for about 12, 10 or 12 weeks that they were in that hacking tower? Yeah, until the birds started to fly. In the, you could actually see them. They were in these cages. And when the wind would come down the reservoir, they'd start flapping and they'd lift right up off the foot of the, the cages. And then it was time to release them. Yeah. Uh, but before they released them, they had to be examined again by... A veterinarian and they put radio transmitters on them so they could follow them around. Um, back then they didn't have the satellite transmitters that they have today so they had radio transmitters and they would put them uh, underneath the tail of a bald eagle as you can see in, the, in this particular picture right here. The long yellow wire is the antenna and the little aluminum part up on the top is the transmitter and they um, they emitted a signal and we had uh, receivers that we used to chase these birds around because the first six uh, months of a bald eagle's life is the, the most the, critical, the most critical. Um, before they let them go they put blue wing markers on next slide. As you can yeah. see in the next one you can see the blue wing markers on these birds they would put them they would sew them into the the wing and that was so when they were flying around you could yeah, yeah next slide they, uh, Shane there, there you, you go, go. Uh, you can see the, the wing marks on the wing marks on these things on these two birds here, and this is pretty good because you know bird watchers and everybody and the researchers could actually follow these with binoculars and tell which birds we were looking at by the by where these wing marks were, and um, it was a pretty good way of keeping track of which birds were which. They o they only did that for a couple years, then th then they eliminated those. Um, in the next picture, you can see. Uh, release day when they decided that the birds were, were old enough to let go um, and they, they always made a, um, a big media day of it. The, right. All the newspaper people were here. Party. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the newspaper people were here and the TV cameras and I mean it was a big thing because eagles had nested in Massachusetts in you know 90 years. So they would let the birds go, they would throw the, the doors open, and the times that I went out there, you, everybody was really excited, and they'd throw the doors open, and it would be just like watching paint dry. Uh, some, sometimes the birds would stay in there. Uh, one year I was out there, a, a bird stayed there overnight, didn't come out till the next day. <laughs> but they would let them go. They had to be the right age. Um, this was pretty tricky because if they were too old, they'd open the doors and they would take right off and they wouldn't hang around and they'd just, they'd bolt, they'd leave the Quabbin area. But ideally what happened was the birds would, usually by noon or one o'clock in the afternoon, the birds would all be out. They wouldn't fly very far. They'd go up the shore or down the shore. Um, and then they, they'd hang around, and as they got a little older, they'd go further and further. So by the end of the summer, they were, you could see them around the Quabbin. But every bird had a transmitter on it. And Dave Nelson and I used to go around two or three times a week, and we'd listen for the signal, and we would had a truck, or we'd get in a boat, uh -huh. Um, Jack Swedberg would get in an aircraft and yeah, fly this, looking, this, looking for the yeah. birds. And we'll look at the nest of, the, of one of the one early ones. This was down in, uh, this is South Quab, and I think this nest. And, um, and again, you know, we, we, the first nest were in 1988 and 89, where the first young fledged in 89. And um, as Dale says, on the next slide, you'll see the area where we actually. Um, did a lot of the monitoring uh, over time. As you, um, as you look, you'll see 
um, the area where the um, um, this shows a map on the left of where the hacking tower and stuff is uh, was at the time. It's been totally removed now, and there isn't a trace of it anywhere. But the um, you know the, it took a big team of folks to actually do this monitoring, and you know all these birds have been you know looked at for the veterinarians, been tracked by boat, and you know using blinds um, to actually keep track of these birds and you know, um, watching where these birds and other birds that were hacked in other parts of the country would actually join them in the wintertime sometimes. And, um, you know, they could actually, by looking at the series of bands or, or, or wing tags or whatever, you could actually figure out which, which birds were who um, as you go through this. And um, on the next slide, we see um, the, um, yeah, you see by, by plane on the, on the left here, we see, um, you know, one of the ways we were able to track where the individual birds were, and each bird had its own um, signal that it gave out, you know, which was more like a Morse code signal around a different frequency, I guess. And so you could actually track which birds were who. And um, the, uh, the truck picture there was Dave Nelson is up at Enfield Lookout down at Quabbin, and it's a pretty good vantage point from there looking up the reservoir. You can really get a pretty good good look at what, um, at um, where these birds are hanging out. And a lot of them would hang out right on that southern end, especially in the wintertime on, on, uh, on the southern slope of Mount Ram. It could, was always a good place to go and watch for eagles. Um, lots, of, lots of people, lots and lots of people would come to the Enfield Lookout down in the Quabbin Park and, and people still, still flock down there. Uh, one thing that continued right up until the mid-90s was a monitoring program. And in the next picture, you can see a blind that we used. Uh, it was heated. Uh, there was propane heaters in there. And why did they monitor the eagles uh, through the winter? Well, uh, there was uh, quite a few reasons. Uh, they wanted to read the leg bands, as Dave said earlier. They had a couple of really good telescopes in there, and we could take pictures. And they, how they would get the uh, eagles in on the ice with carcasses of deer that were court cases. Uh, mass wildlife uh, would always have carcasses that had been hit by cars also, and they would take them and they would x-ray them to make sure there was no lead pellets and then we'd put them on the ice in front of this particular blind and then we'd go in and it was a long day because we'd go in there before the sun come up and we'd stay there until the sun went down and a lot of times there was nothing for hours and then all of a sudden there'd be five, six, eight. Uh, the last couple pictures that you've seen here uh, the one before this, there was 26 bald eagles on the ice. There you go. We're back. Uh, there's close to 26 eagles there. And in the next picture that we were just looking at, you can see there was a lot of birds that would show up there other than eagles. Um, there's, there's a couple of juvenile bald eagles in this picture. And there's one, two, there's five ravens. Um, and sometimes red-tailed hawks would come in. But... Getting along in towards the mid-90s, uh, they, they eliminated it. They, they stopped doing that. There was quite a long period of time, though, that we there in the mid-80s and into the early 90s that we had uh, an annual bald eagle survey that was done by employees of DCR and, uh, and the MDC at the time. Um, but we were um, joined by um, people that worked at Tufts, um, Veterinary Hospital, from Mass Audubon, from the various um, other uh, partners that worked together um, to, uh, to work on raptor rehabilitation around the state. This one particular year, I was um, out on the west arm of uh, Prescott Peninsula, and um, I was with uh, Gus Ben David from Martha's Vineyard. And it was uh, one of those mid-January days, we had about 15 inches of snow on the ground, and uh, we had to trudge our way down in the pre-dawn light um, down to the reservoir's edge, 
And as we were coming down the hill towards the edge of the reservoir, we could hear bald eagles in the trees above us, you know, and they're not very melodic, but, um, but they certainly were making a lot of noise that day. And as we got to the edge of the reservoir, there was a big pine tree with the branches were, you know, fairly low to the ground. We look out and probably 50 yards out on the ice was our deer carcass, fresh deer carcass. And that day we actually were able to, we just hunkered down underneath that pine tree and made ourselves a little camp and just sat there all day long. And we saw 50 different individual birds, you know, almost 25 uh, adults and 25 uh, juveniles. As we watched this deer carcass, ravens came in and took pieces of it. The eagles were coming in. A coyote came out on the ice and grabbed a hunk of the leg and dragged it off into the, you know, off the another direction. It was really quite an exciting day for, um, for, for us and for, for Gus and his brother that were up from Martha's Vineyard. And that, um, that those days in, at that time were ended in either um, up at the New Salem restaurant, if we can remember those days, or at the Quabbin Woods restaurant for a, a good dinner and a good camaraderie from all the different people from all the different agencies that have been involved in the program. And that went on for about a decade or so um, for those that thing. It was pretty, a lot of fun. A lot of fun, yeah. You know, the, great the, people. The competition uh, at Quabbin in the winter is extremely uh, competitive. Uh, I did a study when I was at UMass on how fast one of these deer carcasses um, would disappear on the ice. And I put a camera up on it and I left it for three days. And then I went in and uh, I took the film back to UMass and I um, counted up how many minutes eagles were on it, how many minutes ravens were on it, if there were coyotes on it. And a, a full deer carcass, a dead deer on the Quabbin ice will disappear in 24 hours. And what's left is the bones and the coyotes being canines. They'll get up and they'll just yeah. drug the bones right up into the air, into yeah. the woods. There. Yeah, well, no, it's pretty, you know, they, they do, we, we think of beagles as being these great predators, but really they're, they're scavengers and they're the, yeah. the, the cleanup crew. And, um, you know, I've seen them, uh, you know, in the middle of the woods, you know, picking up on, on roadkill or other things. And they're really not very particular um, about what they, what they feed on. But uh, in the next slide, you'll see, um, um, you know, what we see pretty normally nowadays is, is young bald eagles flying around. Um, it's a, a pair of young ones here. And, and um, you know, it's not uncommon for us to see eagles in any part of the North Quabbin region and beyond these days. There's nests all over the place, um, and we'll be talking more about that in future programs. But uh, here it is, a couple of adult eagles in their courtship displays. And these can be pretty, pretty dramatic uh, to watch the, you know, these birds lock talons and tumble and do all kinds of crazy stuff. It's, it's really kind of a, a great thing the, to see. These pit, this, this picture I took on the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. So they, they've branched out. Um, as of the year 2016, there were a total of 54 bald eagles nesting in Massachusetts from the Cape the Connecticut River, Wachusett Reservoir. Um, there's a couple, couple in the Berkshires. Uh, and they also, uh, Mass Wildlife, they try and band as many of these young chicks as they possibly can. Uh, there had been, as of 216 again, 646 wild eagle chicks had hatched. And Mass Wildlife had, uh, banded 533 of them mm. and there's probably even more now because the, the, right. this count and, was done and, and actually the other thing that's happening is not all the nests are easy to find and as they spread out we do want to hear about um, bald eagle nests there's one in Royalston that we'll talk about in another program but you know we really want to know more about what's happening with the eagles and um, and and where they are you know so um, we want to just have you know the next I just you know thank the people that uh, helped to um, give us these shots of the eagles and 
and um, and what we have here, and and um, there's a good list of folks that um, that contributed photographs, including um, you know the Mass Wildlife and and Bill Byrne and um, a dear friend of ours um, and whatnot. So um, we really want to uh, want to uh, thank everybody for their participation. So um, in our last part of this here, um, go to the next slide, and um, we'll. Uh, yeah, keep going one more, and there we go. There's our, our um, um, this is your slide here, isn't it, Dale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, um, but you know, we, we, it's just great to watch and, and uh, really fun things, you know, to, to watch and have in our own backyard. And um, this brings us to our last um, part of the uh, program, and it's uh, the what the heck kind of stuff. And, um, you know, um, Dale's going to go first with his, <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> that's, that's what I said. What the heck? When this, this black bear jumped up on the wall. Uh, I was in a beaver pond about a month ago, a local beaver pond. And I had been photographing beavers. And the beavers had gone in. It was about 8 o'clock. It was a wonderful morning. To the left of me, about 40 feet away, was a stone wall that went right down to the edge of the, the pond. So I was thinking that I was going to uh, close up shop and hike out of there and head for home. And all of a sudden, I heard this tremendous crashing and thud. And I looked to the left of me, and I thought, what the heck? <laughs> and uh, this black bear... Uh, jumped up on the wall, had jumped up on the wall, and it was looking at me, and I was looking at it, and it was one of those times where you come eye to eye with a, a wild animal. And my heart was in my throat. <laughs> my top of my head was going to explode from the adrenaline, and there were no cubs. The bear didn't seem to be too upset, so I slowly... I turned my 500 millimeter around, and at 40 feet, I took two pitches, <laughs> and the bear, this is, this is the second one, and the bear, just after he heard the click, he turned around, he jumped off the wall, and I, last I saw of him, when he, was, he was running down the shore of the pond. <laughs> Great memory. All right. Um, okay, our last uh, what the heck moment is um, this grasshopper, you know, uh, in, in mid-October, there's not too many insects really left here. It's getting to the end of the season. And this was on the side of my, uh, my barn at home. And this is the, um, the pine tree spur throat grasshopper. And it was once thought to be pretty rare and, um, because it came out late in the season. And all the entomologists looking at grasshoppers would always look in fields and and stuff, but this guy actually lives in the forest and will eat pine needles as a food source, and um, which is very different than most other grasshoppers. And when I read it up, looked it up in the uh, in the in the books, um, it actually has been known to sit on wooden buildings, and there it was. So, but it's quite easy to uh, to uh, identify and and um, a pretty interesting specimen, and and again new for my yard list for sure, but. Um, but this is what we, you know, we do all the time, and, and we always really like to, uh, um, you know, find new things and learn a little bit more about them. And um, someday I may learn a little more about grasshoppers, but that'll do it for today probably. So um, I think we're pretty well set here, and, and thank everybody for your time. And, and uh, Dale and I will be back again another time for right. the, with another couple of stories. And thanks for the comments, everybody. Thanks for watching. And... Um, We'll see you on the other side.